بسم الله بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وصحبه ومن وله أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته. How's everybody doing? Alhamdulillah. So, inshallah ta'ala, we're uh, continuing. Um, so we covered ayah number one in which Ba'd A'udhu Billahi Minash Rajeem Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Ida shamsu kuwirat Allah ta'ala mentions how the sun will be essentially wrapped up as typically how the translation goes. One point that a brother brought to my attention that I thought was quite interesting. Now, again, this, these are, you know, speculative in the sense that, you know, we, we find videos about science and about what, the, what will happen to stars and the sun and so forth. And so this is speculation still, but it's still interesting. One brother was telling me, I'm not endorsing this, I'm simply saying look into, into it for yourself, inshallah ta'ala. He mentioned how uh, he was watching a documentary about the sun, the history of the sun, how it formed and how it will end eventually. And one thing that he mentioned was that uh, the, the hypothesis that scientists have is that near the end of the, 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 the life of the sun, it will actually become more round. It will, I guess, maybe perhaps condense or something. But right now, obviously, it looks generally spherical, but it's not a perfect sphere. And so uh, near, near its end, as the sun is dying, one of the things that will happen is it will become more circular, which is interesting because إِذَا شَمْسُ كُوِّرَتْ You could say the verb كَوَّرَ is to become more of a kuwar, uh, a kura, right? Kura, yani, uh, you know, a ball, right? Kura al-qadam, right? Soccer, etc. So a kura is a ball. So kawara, it could be the verb to become or, or to make something more spherical or circular, kubirat, it will be made more spherical. So that would be something that aligns, that is remarkable. Wallahu ta'ala alim bisawab, Allah ta'ala knows best. Now, of course, I want to mention that this is referring to, you know, there's two stages, two main stages of Judgment Day. Judgment Day beginning when everything's being destroyed, right? And uh, this is what we're describing right now. And then after everything is destroyed and everybody's gone, then there will be resurrection, and then there will be Ard uh, al-Mahshar, everybody will be brought up on the plane, and then at that point, the sun will be close to our heads, as the Prophet says in authentic hadith in Sahih Bukhari, وَتَدْنُوا مِنْهُمُ shams," that the sun will be near them, right? So this is not, so people ask the question, how can you reconcile if the sun is being wrapped and its light is going away, then how can you say that the sun is close? Well, we're talking about two very different events. One of them is this, this, the whole universe coming apart, and then the second one is the sun being close to you after everything's brought back and then you know, people are, being, uh, are in a state of panic because judgment hasn't started yet. So I hope that clarifies that. Anyway, ayah number two, Allah Ta'ala says, what? وَإِذَا النُّجُومُ كَدَرَتْ And when the stars in kadara, it could, be, it could mean what? Uh, are dispersing. It's an interesting term in kadara because we have to remember that in this surah, which is surah 81, and surah 82, surah infitar, the, both of them have the second ayah about the stars. But two different words are used. This one is وَإِذَا النُّجُومُ كَدَرَتْ And in ayah number, uh, in surah uh, infitar, it says what? وَإِذَا الْكَوَاكِبُ تَثَرَتْ so what is the difference between a kawkab and a najm? They're both, they both mean, I mean, in English you'd say star, right? That's it. So, but in Arabic, there's a difference. They both mean star, but najm is highlighting its brilliance and its light, how bright it is. So it's more fitting that the next verb would be in kadarat, which has an emphasis on darkness, as we're going to see in a moment, that it's losing its light. So to, to contrast it. Whereas kawkab, the plural being kawakib, uh, is an emphasis on what? It could be a star or a planet, but its emphasis on, is on two things. Its size and how fixed it is. How big it is and it's in the nature of being fixed. And because, uh, the, you know, they would use the kawakib uh, as, um, like, you know, the North Star for navigation, right? Oh, that's always there, so now I know where to go in the nighttime. They'd use it for navigation because it's fixed. And so it makes sense that Allah Ta'ala would say, وَإِذَا الْكَوَاكِبُنْ تَثَرَتْ In tathara has more of an emphasis on what? On scattering. So there's more of an emphasis. One is, one is, is dispersing and losing its light. To scatter is something much more, you could say, uh, emphatic on the motion. So now what is this a root, uh, the root of this word in kadara, in kadarat? So this is the one time, and by the way, I'm going to say this multiple times in Shalatara, this is the only time that you find these root letters of kaf, dal, ra in the Qur'an. This, this one unique time. And it's amazing how many of these ayats have words that only show up that one time, which really highlights just how unique this entire event is, that Allah Ta'ala is using words that don't show up elsewhere in the Qur'an. And we're going to see a number of examples of that in a moment, inshallah. So yes, this is the only time that you find these root letters of kaf dalara or kadara, right? Kadura uh, yakduru or kadira yakdaru, kadran or kadaratan, kadaratan or kuduratan or kuduran or kudran, so kudratan. There's lots of masadir. It means to be muddy, cloudy, grimy, turbid, to be unhappy, dreary, angry. So it has something to do with being, you know, rough and darker. And in kadara means either to pour out, to, 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 be, to, to, to go out, or it also means to lose one's color. So again, there's an emphasis on losing its light. 
So if the sun is wrapped and we don't see its light and the stars lose their light too, both during the day and night, humanity will be in darkness. That's, of course, if humanity is still alive at that point. But if we're not even sure about that, this could be after everybody has passed and Allah knows best. But there is something very miraculous about this. Allah Ta'ala is describing how um, the light will be completely knocked out, right? First eye is about the shams, and the second eye is about an nujum. These are two, you know, sources of light, one during the day, one during the night. Why didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention al-qamar, the light of the qamar? Why not? Now we know, right? Science, science, now we know why, because what? Somebody tell me. Exactly, because the sun is out, right? See, if, subhanAllah, this is the beauty of the Qur'an, that subtly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, obviously, if it was from a human being, they could have made the mistake of saying, oh, first the sun's light goes out, and then later on, the source of light, the moon, it goes out. And you'd be like, no, wait a second, once the sun is gone, there's no more moonlight, right? Obviously, because if one is dependent on the other. So Allah Ta'ala says, إِذَا الشَّمْسُ كُوِّرَتْ وَإِذَا النُّجُومُ كَدْرَتْ You're like, why would you go from the biggest source of light to the third source of light, when the second is obviously the moon? Right? And it's because, well, it's once the sun is gone, there's no, more, there's no more moon. Now, they didn't know that back then, necessarily, but subhanAllah, we know that today. And that little subtle point, I think, is very, very powerful, beautiful, and worthy of note. And Allah knows best. Then, Allah, uh, uh, we should also, uh, related verses, what, when Allah says, وَإِذَن نُجُومُ الطُّمِسَتْ When the stars are completely obliterated. This is mentioned in Surah 77, which is Surah Mursalat, ayah number 8. Then Allah says in the next ayah, وَإِذَا الْجِبَالُ سُيِّرَتْ there's a lot of emphasis, this, this, verb, uh, this verb of uh, sayyara. So what does sayyara mean? It means to casually move away. And this is the uh, uh, nominal form where the, uh, the, the, the noun is mentioned first, the verb is mentioned second, وَإِذَا الْجِبَالُ سُيِّرَتْ as opposed to the switch in Surah uh, 78, Surah An-Naba, ayah number 20, وَسُيِّرَتِ الْجِبَالُ فَكَانَتْ سَرَابًا So it's the same two words, but they are in different order. And the mountains are removed, or they casually move away. Uh, and uh, it, will, it will be but like a mirage, subhanAllah. So what is this talking about? There's a number of different tafasir or understandings. This could be a reference to earthquakes, something very rough and violent that breaks down the mountains and that also uh, 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 breaks it down into fine little pieces. Now you might say to yourself, well, sayyara seems to be less of a violent term, more of a soft term. So why would that apply? Well, one interpretation is that just to show how easy this is for Allah. For you guys on earth, you guys are panicking, seeing everything shaking, and you think that this is something so dreadful. Allah Ta'ala is saying, this is like nothing for me. I can, I, can, I can destroy everything. So that's one interpretation, and Allah knows best. But another one could be a reference to sayyara, uh, uh, means to uh, flatten out. Why? Because this is in preparation for Judgment Day. All of the mountains will be flattened, and everybody will be on this plane later on when they're resurrected. And the third interpretation, which I think is, seems to be the strongest because it has the most ayat that are related to it, is that this is when gravity will be lost, when there is no more gravitational pull and that gravity is out of whack and so you will see that the mountains will start to float around. And this is uh, supported by several ayat. Allah says, وَتَرَى الْجِبَالَ تَحْسَبُهَا جَامِدَةً وَهِيَ تَمُرُّ مَرَّ السَّحَابِ And you will see the mountains, thinking of them rigid, while they pass as the passing of clouds. This is in Surah An-Naml, ayah number 88. So you can imagine seeing a gigantic mountain sort of passing like a cloud. So you know, back then, I'm sure it would be almost impossible to imagine something like that. But nowadays, when we think of what? Loss of gravity, and therefore things, you know, like uh, meteors, etc., things would be moving uh, slowly, and you can imagine such a scene. Allah Ta'ala also says what? وَلَوْ أَنَّ قُرْآنًا سُيِّرَتْ بِهِ الْجِبَالِ If there was a Qur'an which by, the, by, by which the mountains would be removed and move, could move mountains. أَوْ قُطِّعَتْ بِهِ الْأَرْضِ Or the earth would be broken in apart. Or that the dead would be able to speak, it would be this Qur'an. Allah Ta'ala is saying that this Qur'an is so heavy that if the earth were to be cut up, the mountains would be moved, and the dead were, be, would to, be, were to be made to speak, it would be this kalam, this word of Allah Ta'ala that could do it. Allah Ta'ala says, وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْجِبَالِ فَقُلْ يَنْسِفُهَا رَبِّي نَسْفَى And they ask you about the mountains, say, my Lord will blow them away with a blast. So there's many ayat that refer to this, the mountains being removed. Why? Because the mountains are you could say the greatest symbol of stability, keeping the earth firm, something that holds tight. And the whole idea is to let you know, oh human being, if the mountains won't have fixture on this day, what about you? Stop thinking that, oh, I will last forever and look at my monuments and what I have built and what I have done and oh, I, I wanna leave my legacy. Yes, mashallah, you try your best to do good, but at the end of the day, this is all a test and everything will go, go away. Allah Ta'ala says, وَيَوْمَ نُسَيِّرُ الْجِبَالِ And the day when we will remove the mountains. Again, this verb of تَسْيِّرُ uh, 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 or uh, سَيِّرَ Yes, وَتَكُونُ الْجِبَالُ كَلِعِهْنُ 
right? al ihn means like, like wood, like wool. So again, the, the mountains will be like, you know, fluff, the fluff of, of wool. It'll be completely just floating in the air lightly. So subhanAllah, uh, uh, we need to remind ourselves, again, and this was asked in the last, uh, last week, about the question of what about the time frame regarding all this? Allah Ta'ala doesn't give a time frame to these things. So the question of, how long does it take for the sun's light to be wrapped? How long does it take for stars to fall out of orbit? How long does it take for the mountains to be removed? I'm not saying that you're going to see all this in one shot. I'm not saying, you know, this could be over a long span of time or short. Allah Ta'ala knows best. And it's also interesting that when we're in need of direction, we depend upon the stars to navigate ourselves during the night. And of course, we use the mountains to navigate us during the day, you know, especially back in the day when they would go traveling, they would remember certain milestones, certain mountains to remember their navigation. And so the fact that these things are being completely knocked out of out of, uh, out of uh, existence and destroyed. The theme here clearly is utter confusion. This is a time of utter confusion. Now Allah Ta'ala brings it now to us. And Allah says what? وَإِذَا الْعِشَارُ عُطِّلَتْ And when the, so what is this عِشَار? Now the, the weaker opinion is that عِشَار is a reference to clouds and عُطِّلَتْ means they aren't giving rain anymore. This seems to be the weaker position. The only reason I mention it is because it's in line with the other two verses about the stars, the sun, and then the clouds. It's all in the theme of what is above you. But still, this is the weakest opinion. The stronger opinion, it seems to be very straightforward, is that uh, uh, عِشَار is in reference to a naqa. Naqa means a, a she-camel, uh, the plural being nuq. And a عُشَرَة uh, or عَشَرَة is a 10-month pregnant she-camel and the plural is Ishar. So this is representing both a status symbol and great wealth. And the verb Attala means to, uh, to be made useless. And the root letters of Ayn uh, Talam only occur twice. The only other time is when Allah says, uh, when the well is abandoned. So anyway, uh, what's interesting here is that why is a 10 month pregnant she camel so valuable? Well, because it's going to soon produce another camel, and secondly, it's going to start producing milk. So these are two very valuable things, especially at that time. So you can imagine somebody, you know, imagine nowadays you would say like, oh, the Lamborghini or the Ferrari is just abandoned, or the, somebody's private jet is just sitting there on the runway, and nobody cares about it. And you're like, oh my God, look at that gold-plated, I don't know, uh, you know, uh, jet or whatever the case is, or the yachts or whatever the case is, and it's just like everybody's abandoned them. They're just rotting and falling apart. What happened? Clearly something happened, uh, some sort of apocalyptic, uh, apocalyptic event, so that people no longer care about their wealth. wealth. So this is a time when a thing that has future value, and that's what's so beautiful about it, Allah mentions right before it gives birth. So that means it's gonna have future value in just a moment. But this whole concept of future value will be utterly useless because there's no future to look forward to in this dunya, in this world. It's a time of certain death. Therefore, the only thing that could possibly have value will be whatever has value in the afterlife. So yes, the pregnant uh, uh, camels were well guarded so they wouldn't be lost or stolen or harmed because of their high value. And what's interesting is that the materialistic person only values their wealth and they will abandon it. And this is, um, uh, uh, and whereas the decent person, he cares about his family. And yet, subhanAllah, even on that day, people will abandon their family. On that day, you will see every nursing mother will be distracted from the child that it was nursing. Same thing with the surah right before it, surah 80, surah Abasa, right prior to this surah. And from ayat 34 to 37, Allah is saying, uh, You're going to run away from your own family members. You're going to run away from your wealth. You're going to be running away from everything because you'll be in utter chaos, subhanAllah. What's also fascinating, which we're going to be mentioning this again later, is that this is the first pregnancy mentioned in the surah, but there's a second one, which is what? When the young girl that was buried is going to be asked, what was your crime? What infraction? What sin did you do? SubhanAllah, the fact that there's this parallel between them showing that, oh, I have so much care because my camel is pregnant, that's, that's going to give me wealth. What happened to your daughter? SubhanAllah, uh, uh, these, these were people who completely abandoned uh, their own family for the sake of wealth because they thought, oh, more family members, I'm just gonna, it's just going to cost me more uh, money. A'udhu Billah, may Allah protect us. Then Allah says what? وَإِذَا الْوُحُوشُ حُشِرَتْ And when the wild beasts are gathered. Again, we have a case where the root letters of wow, ha, and sheen, this only occurs this one time in the entire Qur'an. Again, showing the uniqueness of this surah. Wahshun means a wild animal, something that is impossible to domesticate, the plural being wahush. Wahsha yahishu, wahshan means to walk alone, to evacuate, to abandon, to throw away, to run, to just, you know, uh, just the same way when you see, let's say, deer in the field and you get a little bit close, they're just gone. They just immediately run away. So these type of uh, animals are usually either in the mountains, you know, they try to stay away from human beings, they try to stay in the mountains, but what's the problem with that? 
وَإِذَا الْجِبَالُ سُيِّرَتْ On that day, the mountains are going to be gone. So where are they going to go, right? Uh, uh, there's a real problem here. So uh, it's very interesting that in the previous surah, Allah mentions how humans will be scattered on that day, and yet we're learning about uh, how uh, typically humans stick together, and these animals, they're always dispersed, and yet on that day, things are going to be backwards, that, uh, uh, that subhanAllah, they will be gathered. When animals gather uh, and lose their instinct to fight or to hunt or to flee from one another, that's when you know their natural instincts are being completely overrun by the fear of an impending catastrophe. And so we see that the last verse was highlighting how some men are like animals because they're entirely occupied by catching the best prey, which is what? The 10 month pregnant she camel. That's all they care about. I gotta catch the best prey. I gotta get that wealth, right? So it's this animalistic, materialistic attitude that they have. And in this verse, it's stressing that on that day, even the animals won't care about their prey, which explains why even the most materialistic and animalistic human being won't care about their prey or their wealth either. So I hope you see there's a parallel between the last verse and this one. Yes, and then uh, the two main instances in which you see animals naturally being together, which I think is really quite fascinating, and sometimes you see this on the news. Sometimes you'll see a bunch of animals that don't usually stick together, and they're all together, and, and like people will take pictures of it or video of it. When does this usually happen in, in normal life? In two cases, during extreme flooding or during extreme fires, right? During extreme flooding or fires, you'll find that animals are so panicked, they don't know where to go, and they're not even paying attention to the other animals around them, right? And what's amazing about that, uh, because usually they find some small patch of land that's safe, and they all just gather there, and they can't think of anything else. And what's interesting is that the very next verse implies kind of both at the same time. sujirat When the oceans are sujirat, could imply on fire or could be flooding. So these animals are gathered together, why? Because of either fire or flooding, usually. And then the next ayah combines both of these concepts together. So you see a very, very beautiful uh, uh, con con continuity there. I don't want to take too much time, but I want to mention this one point quickly, inshallah ta'ala, that will animals be resurrected? This is the question. And um, it could, uh, one opinion is that this ayah is in reference to animals being brought back for qisas, for uh, justice between them. Allah Ta'ala mentions this uh, when Allah says, وَمَا مِن دَابَّةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا طَائِرَةٍ يَطِيرُ بِجَنَاحَيْهِ إِلَّا أُمَمٌ أَمْثَالُكُمْ مَا فَرَّطْنَا فِي الْكِتَابِ مِنْ شَيْءٍ ثُمَّ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ يُحْشَرُونَ There is no creature uh, on this, uh, or on or within the earth, or even a bird that flies uh, with its wings, except that they are in communities like you. We have not neglected in the register a single thing. Then unto their Lord, they will all be gathered. So Allah is mentioning that every single one of these animal communities, everything will be gathered to Allah Ta'ala. And the Prophet says what? Uh, so rights will certainly be restored to those that are they are entitled to on them on the day of resurrection, even to the point that the hornless sheep will lay claim upon the horned sheep. So you can imagine two sheep in the dunya, one hit the other, and you know he's like, oh, you had more, you know, you had more horn, and therefore you had uh, you were more able to hurt me. And so they will do a qisas and it will have justice and retribution between them. Why? What is the point of that? At the end of it, all of them will be turned to dust anyhow. And so this is not because they're going to go to heaven or hell. Rather, it is all one big demonstration to just show how exact Allah Ta'ala has kept everything in a register. So as human beings see that, as the human beings watch, as every last little right will be given, even between the animals and insects and fish and everything will be given its right, then they will all be turned to dust. That's when the disbeliever will say, They will say, oh, I wish I was dust too. Can I, you know, can we be given our qisas and I can turn to dust too? Is that okay? No, uh, uh, no, you don't, you can't. That doesn't apply to you. So if Allah Ta'ala will resurrect animals that aren't responsible, then what about us humans that are responsible for our deeds? Because animals just act on instinct, whereas we have free will. If animals will be resurrected, uh, the animals specifically that are hard to catch, then what about us humans that are much easier to catch? Ibn Abbas says what? Hashara kulla shay'in al maut. Death gathers everything. Everything is gathered in death. So this is one interpretation. And therefore this could mean, this could be a reference to all animals being gathered by death. They're all being killed. And therefore this hi highlights that every human and every living creature will perish, even those in the oceans, as the very next verse is about what? وَإِذَا الْبِحَارُ سُجِّرَتْ So inshallah ta'ala, I'll stop there and we'll continue with ayah number six in next week's uh, halaqa. And inshallah ta'ala, I think uh, you will find that, alhamdulillah, this is um, going to get more and more interesting as we go on. So I hope we all continue. بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى بَارَكَ اللَّهِ فِيكُمْ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَةُ اللَّهِ تَعَ